learned in our day when the high-sounding platitudes of men have denied us the centrality of truth that it is important for us to speak upon the great issues that are part of our times and also a part of this generation. What we are saying and what we are doing is not new as far as the people of God are concerned. Throughout many years of history, there have been times when the prophets of God had to declare themselves in no uncertain terms. Let me call to your memory a story that is taken from the book of 1 Kings. It is found in the 22nd chapter of the book of 1 Kings, and it has to do with the story of Jehoshaphat, Ahab, and the prophet called Micaiah. Two of these men were kings. One was the king of Israel, the other the king of Judah. And the prophet Micaiah was a man of God who was fearless in his prognostications. He was the kind of man who declared what the Lord laid upon his heart. He was not afraid of the regal splendor of an Ahab, the authority of a wicked king who had set himself in a high place without any regard for God or man, because Micaiah was a prophet who declared the whole counsel of God without fear or favor. In fact, Ahab considered him his nemesis. It was the habit of kings in those days to consult with the prophets before they went to war. It seems that in our day, instead of consulting with men of God, many leaders of nations in our world consult with fortune tellers and exponents of wizardry. But in those days, even though the kings sometimes were very wicked, they recognized the vital importance of hearing from the man of God. Micaiah was a man who would not spare because of the feelings of an individual. He would tell it like it was. He would declare the word of God even at if it meant personal suffering. For he remembered that he was a man called of God. One day they called on the prophet, and this is the story from the Bible. Then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about four hundred men, and said unto them, Shall I go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall I forbear? And they said, Go up, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. And Jehoshaphat said, Is there not a prophet of the Lord besides that we might inquire of him? Apparently, Jehoshaphat was aware of the fact that there were false prophets and that there were men who did not declare the whole counsel of God. There were men who were in the position of the so-called preacher recognition because of position and because of remuneration. But this man recognized that they would rather hold their jobs than declare the truth. So he asked the question, Is there not a prophet of the Lord beside these four hundred? And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, There is yet one man, Micaiah, the son of Emiah, by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him. This is Ahab speaking now. For he doth not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. And Jehoshaphat said, Let not the king say so. You see, Ahab was saying in substance, I don't like that preacher prophet. When he talks, he talks against me. And of course, this man Micaiah had every reason to talk in opposition to Ahab. Because Ahab was a worshiper of idols. He taught the nation to sin against God. He and his wife Jezebel had been a horrible influence in the deterioration of the religious life of the nation. Micaiah was a man of God. It's the duty of the men of God to declare the word of God in spite of what men feel or what they may say or what emotional conflicts rise up in their hearts against the man of God. Hear me again. The man of God must not be persuaded by his society. He must not be persuaded by those who hold authority over him when it comes to truth. 
he must be persuaded by Almighty God to speak the truth when it is demanded of him. So when Micaiah was called before the kings, he became a little facetious at this point. He walked in and said, As the Lord liveth. Now actually, the prophet was indulging in a little sarcasm. And Micaiah said, As the Lord liveth. What the Lord saith to me, that will I speak. So he came to the king, and the king said unto him, Micaiah, what shall we do? Shall we go to battle against Ramoth Gilead, or shall we forbear? And he answered, Go and prosper. For the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. And then the king said unto him, How many times shall I adjure thee that thou tell me nothing but that which is true in the name of the Lord. Now, this was Ahab speaking. Then Micaiah spoke out of his heart that which was the truth of God. And he said, I saw all Israel scattered upon the hills as sheep that had not a shepherd. And the Lord said, These have no master. Let them return every man to his house in peace. He was telling Ahab that he had no future prospect of victory, that he ought to let the men go home because he was leading them into certain destruction. He told the king just exactly what the situation was. When he told the king how the matter stood in the eyes of God, this is what happened to the prophet. Thus saith the king, put this fellow in prison Feed him with bread of affliction until I come in peace. And Micaiah said, If thou return in peace, the Lord hath not spoken to me. And he said, Hearken, O people, every one of you. In substance, he said, Listen to me, people. This man will not come back in peace. For God Almighty has spoken the word. And the word is that he shall lead you to destruction and into a fatal position in the heat of the battle. You see, it takes strong desire, and it takes dedication to duty, and it takes an understanding of purpose to declare the truth in the hour when falsity prevails. The hour of Ahab and his nation with a prophet like Micaiah is similar to the hour in which we live. Today we are beginning to see the very serious advance of sin encroaching on men. The pulpit has been blunted. It has been cut down. It has become the actual aim of men of might and reputation and ability to sway the preacher. Untold men who stand behind the pulpit are afraid to declare themselves for fear of crossing influential people. I would like for you to know today that the true man of God tells it like it is, and he declares with no uncertain terms the real truth of Almighty God. Today, there's a very strange thing taking place amongst our youth. I understand in a recent article that was given to me that suicide is becoming the leading cause of the immense fatality rate amongst young people. Recently, an article said that teenagers are turning off life at a serious rate. And they explained that suicide is the statistical leader over major diseases amongst teenagers. They also explained that in the college age bracket, There are more suicides than automobile accidents. When we recognize this, it brings a question of wonderment into our mind. Why do young people snuff out life that is given to them? Why do teenagers turn off life at this statistical rate, which is so serious? The answer was given by several psychologists. These are the answers that they gave. The reason is six statements. First of all, too early sexual experience brings frustration. Insecurity and domestic conditions coming from broken homes. The lack of respect for parental authority. The pressure of competition for status and jobs. The bleak future clouded by wars and international turmoil. Last but not least, 
a materialistic society that has become the object of so many. Into this maze of confusion, our young people are plunged. They find themselves at the dead-end road of despair, not knowing which way to turn. Friend, as I speak over harvest time today, I would like to say to our listeners that the Lord Jesus brings with Him happiness. He brings peace when He enters the human life. With His Spirit, there is joy in the Lord. And this is an abundant, effervescent, overflowing life that brings with it interest, excitement, a joyful experience of which the psalmist of old said, In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand pleasures forevermore. In the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, there is an answer to the vexing problem of the youth of our times. Here is something that's so vital for every young person, and for that matter, any person. Personal confrontation with Jesus Christ. It means that you must come to Him. Recognize His Lordship. Recognize His sovereign power over your life. It's coming to Him, believing that in His Spirit there is power to transform the human life. It is believing that the Word of God which declares ye must be born again can happen and bring you a new life. You can and must be born again. It is a recognition that Jesus our Lord can baptize you with the Holy Spirit and power. That is, immerse your whole being, your thought center, your spiritual heart, your physical man, everything that is you, the personal you, baptized, immersed in the power of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. When he comes in, he brings transforming life. That's the answer to the problems of our youth of today. If you ask me how you can discover that experience, I would urge you, find a place of prayer. The best place to find that is at the altar of a church that preaches the total Word of God. The best place to find it is in a church that knows the truth of the apostolic gospel. That early gospel that was preached by the apostles in the book of Acts. You must repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins and ye shall be filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. Yes, my friend, it's the answer to the problems that are vexing the youth of our day. You see, when Jesus came on the scene, it has told us in the New Testament that the emergence of this figure was one of the great events in all human history. John in his Gospel tells us that the Word was in the beginning, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Then John explains that the Word that was God was life. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. John explained that the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten Father, of the Father, full of grace and truth. John was saying in his Gospel, that this Jesus came to bring life. My Lord Jesus is the creator of the world. The Bible declares all things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. Who, he who made the world came to bring salvation into your life. He who made all things can take your life and mold it in his hands. He can change that nightmare of frustration that dilemma of confusion, that terror of fear that grips your heart, and in its place can put the brightness of His presence. When He does this, you will discover that in all of His glory and in all of His power, He can do exceeding abundantly above all you can ask or think. A trip into the Spirit of God or into a Holy Spirit experience is greater, so much greater, 
than any kind of a dope addiction or a shooting of dope or of taking of cocaine or of smoking of marijuana. Yes, friend, we're telling it like it is. There are many, many who will not believe it, but I want to declare it to you again. Jesus Christ is the answer to the problems of this bitter and torn world. There's no other answer. There is not one other solution to your problem. You must come to Jesus Christ. Wherever our voice is being beamed today, and the sound of harvest time goes out, we are praying in the name of the Lord that you would consider this Lord. Turn your face from a disappointing world to the Lord Jesus Christ who can save to the uttermost. And more than that, sanctify your life. And then transform your whole disposition and nature. We are urging you to do it today, for we are absolutely persuaded that this is the day of harvest, and we are living in the time of the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and awaiting His coming at any moment. And in the midst of the wars that are threatening every area of our world today, put your hope in the Prince of Peace. For there is where you can find the answer to the puzzling confusion that has benighted our times. Young man and woman, any aged person who is listening to me, whether you're very youthful, or whether you're a child of understanding, or an adult in the late years of life, my Lord became a child to understand children. He was a son to understand parents. But he was more than that. He was the wonderful. And he was counselor. No greater counsel comes from him. He is the mighty God, the everlasting Father, and finally, the Prince of Peace. If you'll discover him in his...